All right. So this actually was a um, a fairly easy chat. I mean, well, I should say relatively easy chapter compared to I don't know some of these like the MCMC stuff. I'm I'm uh, <laughs> still struggling with. I have to go back and reread some some things. But so I don't know this in in. It, it felt sort of like this was a seminal chapter in terms of, um, you know, classification and, you know, all the issues that are typical for this type of stuff. But also, I think it was cool that they kind of explained to us, um, you know, like where the, the, the weaknesses are, I should say, like, you know, but why it's perhaps naive. And we'll talk about that. So anyway, uh, just some of this is just all taken from the book. I just wanted to mostly it's just to keep me sort of focused. Um, so these are the goals we know to kind of learn about the inner workings of naive bays implemented in R, um, which is what I have here. This is a Cordo file, which is the new R markdown we've used before. Excuse me, I'm already fighting fall illnesses. Um, and so develop strategies for to evaluate the quality um, so what have we done so far? We've used logistic regression, which I missed. Sorry about that last week, but um, obviously this is a very important type of modeling for, well, coming from a biostats, biostatistics background, it's a very important one because we often model things like mortality or morbidity or, or some kind of, you know, dichotomous event that's super important for whatever we're trying to study. So um, not, not to poo-poo this type of modeling, but it has its limits because of course the outcome has to be binary. It has to be a yes and a, and a no. It has to be some kind of all or none kind of, well, typically I should say it's an all or none kind of um, outcome. Uh, but what about categories with more than two levels? Um, yeah, so this is where we get sort of, um, you know, the, the advantages of doing this naive base classification versus what we did in the the last chapter. So you can classify, you know, a response variable with more two or more categories. Um, doesn't really require much beyond the Bayes rule, which was helpful. As I said, I'm, I don't think I've got, I think you all have learned more than me. I'm still <laughs> struggling with some of this stuff just because I don't use it enough daily. Um, yeah, so it's we don't have to do any MCMC stuff, but I do love this. This was like at the end of one of the paragraphs. These benefits don't come without a cost, you know, sort of. Uh, I like that. It's a little foreshadowing for us there, right? Um, this idea that you know, just because we can do this classification, it's not always going to be. It's not a panacea, right? And that's the word naive is is particularly highlighted. Um, so anyway, we've got a bunch of penguins. This is sort of the theme of uh, this chapter. Every chapter seems like has a, a new or different um, sort of topic. And this is, uh, yeah, we see the penguins a lot. The penguins are like the new, um, uh, what are what are like, uh, what are some of the like, oh, yeah, like uh, the diamonds ones, you know, this is like the new diamonds data set, you know, that everybody seems to analyze, right, the penguins. So we've got three species, Adelaide, Adele, Adelaide, Chinstrap, and Gen 2. Um, so, you know, if we were trying to, um, you know, uh, figure out, you know, like just on average, if we were to pick you know, any um, penguin at random, and presuming these are the three, only three species that we would possibly draw, and we'd be like most likely to say the Adelaide, Adel is it, am I pronouncing that right? Sorry, I don't mean to like, is that when everyone else gets it? Is it Adelai? Adelai? Ron, do you, you guys? Know? I do not know. I go okay. with Well, let's go with Adelai, I guess. Um, yeah. Gen, gen strap and then and Gen 2. So the most common one would be the Adelai and, and the least common would be Chin strap. But that's based on nothing other than just counts, right? So the proportion of counts in a population, so we're, we're probably not doing great because we're not using any other information. And that's when we bring in the first categorical predictor, um, which, and by the way, in this case, it's important to point out since we just had this whole discussion above about you know categories versus dichotomous outcomes, categories here are just dichotomous um, categories, right? So this is, you know, are you above average weight, yes or no, which is, I guess, less than 4,200 grams is not above 
um, average weight. So, you know, what happens when we try to use this information about a particular penguin, um, you know, to uh, to try to predict, you know, what um, what which type of penguin we might get. So, um, this was the, um, the the combination of uh, type of species with you know uh, being above this is a really big sorry I didn't mean for this to be so big but yeah so obviously what we see here is for you know the gen 2 we have the least um, above average weights I don't know if anyone else had this confusing but like uh, the fact that we're not we're trying to predict under above average weight as opposed to above average weight and you know like I don't know, it was a little confusing to me, but anyway, this is the least likely because, well, I mean, just looking at this graph, because of course, this most of the, the Gen 2 are, um, are above average weights in the blue, and chin straps are the smallest proportion, or I should say the largest proportion of below average weight, followed by um, Adelaide. So based on just this information alone, we would say, hey, chin strap, Penguins are most likely to be below average, but um, you know we have to also use the sort of prior information that we got up here, which is hey, chin straps are also the least uh, frequent occurring uh, uh, species in our three species grouping here. So that we need to incorporate that um, into you know this prior sort of knowledge that we had about about those three group um, frequencies. And proportions. Um, and so we bring back our friend, um, the Bayes rule. I, like, I, found, I don't know where I found this, but somewhere online, I, I kind of like the way that they did all the grouping of all the pieces, right? So trying to figure out, um, you know, what a species is given. Um, uh, excuse, uh, wait, hold on. Sorry. Actually, in this case, we're trying to figure out. Um, oh, yeah. So it's what species is it given? Um, that it's below or above average, right? So we can sort of uh, look at this here and say, all right, well, um, in the case of um, each species, we have you know how many how many there are total of that species, which is what we saw above. We are, we have already seen these numbers above, but this sort of breakdown group um, by breakdown by. Um, um, above average or not. So these are obviously below average. And I didn't want to try to copy all of this stuff into text. So I'm just going to kind of walk us through this. Um, right. So we can, we can directly calculate the posterior of our species from this table. Um, so now um, if we just were to look at the Adelaide, Adelaide, a species given that they're, um, not above average in weight, we would say, okay, 126 divided by all possible um, uh, um, non above average penguins. So 126 divided by 93 is basically 65% posterior chance that this penguin is a Adelai. Um, and we can do the same thing for all three species. Uh, oh, excuse me, in this case, we're actually saying um, what is the, you know, the, just based on our, the, this is our prior stuff, right? So this is, you know, out of the hundred and, uh, excuse me, out of the total of 342, how many were at Adelaide, um, how many were um, chin straps and how many were gen two. Um, so we can use those things to um, calculate, uh, you know, likelihoods uh, for each given a non um, above average weight. And we get this. So then we plug in these priors and likelihoods, and we get um, once again a 65%. You know, so once we we use our Bayes rule, we can confirm that there's about a 65% chance that the um, given a non um, above average weight that the penguin is an Adelaide. Um, so yeah. So basically, it's not really close, right? This is based on this information alone, this one categorical predictor, which is yes or no, um, above average or whatever the number of grams that was. Um, yeah, so we can use that and it can give us 
more information than just saying, hey, you know, this is the, the frequency and proportion of, um, you know, each species uh, within a sample that we have prior to this sort of incorporation of the um, above average size. So then um, moving back into, um, yeah, so, right, so just real quick, the summary is that um, the, although the below average weight is relatively less common and analyzed than chin straps, the final classification is pushed over the edge by the fact that analyzes are far more common. So if you remember in that one stacked bar plot, we saw a lot more chin strap non above or below average weights, but there's just so few of them that that's being taken into the the um, consideration so now we have hey, uh, ryan it looks like ama has her little oh sorry on. sorry yeah i uh go ahead yeah it wasn't i think it's not i didn't want to interrupt you it's just why are we to be doing mcmc in this chapter is it because like the data is small um it's a good question. I mean, I guess, um, well, we're only, I mean, we're not making a sort of, um, we're, we're not making any kind of like inference beyond what the sample, what the sample is giving us. What, what, I mean, what would you say, Ron? Well, this naive Bayes technique is really not a restrictive, you know, it uses Bayes rules, but it's not really like a proper Bayes in analysis technique. What you don't, you know, you don't form a, a uh, posterior over the probabilities, for example, right? You just calculate directly a probability. So it's, you know, it's kind of a weird case. Mm -hmm. I think they put it in there to give you a tool to use for multi uh, categorical, categorical data like this without having to go into the complexity of multinominal Bayesian regression. It is possible to do a proper ex yeah. exten extension of the logistic regression to multiple categories. Um, but I think it's, it's complicated enough that I, it's not in any of the standard textbooks. So and as we'll talk about or maybe it isn't that complicated but i've never done it i've never done it either i mean i've done multinomial sort of traditional multinomial yeah regression, but i don't know if we're answering your question ama um but yeah i think the answer is this is not a strictly you know you can find this technique naive base for example in uh, any book on statistical learning it's not a yeah it's, it's not i don't really consider it a necessarily a bayesian technique you know it does use Bayes rule to, uh, mm -hmm. to calculate things yeah um, that's kind of that's my explanation, if if you will. <laughs> yeah, because this feels like they teach this in like normal stats using the marginals to find. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it really you know, is. That's, that's yeah. kind of my I meant. That's a great. That's a great point. Alma. I, I I meant the same thing kind of when I said this is a sort of simpler chapter because we're, we're we've gotten rid of some of those fancier tools that obviously are the hallmark of of previous chapters, right? But um, don't worry, they'll be coming back in part. They'll be time. coming back. Yeah, big time. Of course. For sure. Um, Thank you. Yeah, no, yeah, no worries. Just and just go ahead and speak up. Uh, I, I have my camera off. Uh, just so I think it's yeah. a great observation, Amak, because yeah, this is like kind of like take a little side trip to this. I, I think it's nice. So you know, it's a nice little technique that illustrates Bayes rules. I mean, they could have done this in chapter one, though, right? I mean, does it really? It, mm -hmm. um, it just that they want to make the comparison with uh, with the logistic regression that we just did, right? Which yeah, no, is the alternative. That's true. And, you know, to your point about you doing multinomial, I mean, obviously, if we were to do that, I mean, that would be, we would do that. I'm, I'm already sort of jumping the gun here, but we would, we would do that if we, we don't feel like the conditional independence assumption between predictors can be met, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that's probably one of the main things that we would do, but I'll come back to that. Yeah. All right. So now we've, we, we've, we've gone from having nothing, you know, to try to predict any given, what the species of any given penguin is, um, you know, given, you know, all, starting out with only the frequency of each, you know, and in, in, in proportion of each in a, in a sample. Um, and that, then we went to, you know, using, you know, above or below average weights and the incorporating both, you know, the proportion of occurrences of all of those, um, those uh, um, species, and then with along with the you know sort of the information about you know what their what their um, average weight is, or you know if, if they're above average weight or not. So now we, we're we're going to talk about um, things that aren't just yes or no kinds of predictors, but they actually have um, a distribution, like I mean standard deviation. In this case, we'll speak to 
um, bill length in millimeters. Um, and we're going to group that by, um, by species. And as they talk about in the book, sorry, this is really big. Um, you know, obviously, um, chin strap and, 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 and Gen 2 are pretty close together and then the Adelis are, you know, pretty far to the left. So, you know, um, we have 50 as sort of like this um, mean point. It's obviously pretty hell and gone from there, but the other two are pretty close. So now it's like, how do we incorporate this information of these distributions into our um, calc into our Bayes rule to try to figure out, given, you know, um, a certain length of, of um, bills, you know, what, what, what we see. So, um, so yeah, so some things to note from the book, 50 millimeter long bill is extremely long for the Adelaide, which is in the salmon color here, pinkish color, pretty, the distribution is pretty far to the left. Um, the, obviously the difference between chin straps and, and Gen 2 are pretty, it's pretty slight. Um, I mean, obviously we'd probably say the, the chin strap um, is on average, you know, higher um, than uh, the, the Gen 2. Um, so yeah, so just off the bat, if we were just to try to say, okay, given nothing but the bill length, we'd probably say, hey, you know, uh, the best bet would be a chin strap because, um, you know, that's, they're, the, they're probably the, the species, you know, where 50 is most likely to be just occurring on average, right? Because it's so close to the center of that distribution or, you know, compared to the other two, at least. Um, so the problem is, is, you know, this isn't a categorical thing. Sorry. Um, this isn't a categorical thing. This is a, you know, quantitative thing. So we can't just say, hey, uh, what's the likelihood of, you know, the species being an Adelaide given um, a length of 50, we have to um, make some assumptions that, you know, the uh, quantitative predictor is continuous and conditionally normal. That is, each free, within each species, bill length are normally distributed and with possible different means of the standard deviations. Now, is that, you know, can, would, can we say that, that that assumption is warranted given the, what we've seen here? I think so, right? Um, I mean, well, I mean, it's, they're not perfect normal distributions, but I've seen a lot worse of things in my work as a statistician uh, where we've just made assumptions. So these, you know, at least we're on, you know, board with perhaps doing that, right? So, um, and so what we can do is given sort of the parameter, or excuse me, the distribution um, estimated parameters for mean standard deviation, we can tune the model so that it's specific to the mean and standard deviation of each species and, you know, looks a little bit nicer. Obviously we've, you know, we've um, well, just using those two things as, as, as estimated parameters, we've kind of smoothed out, you know, some of the roughness in that distribution. And we, we see here um, still the same picture basically from what's up above. It's just, um, you know, a little bit cleaner, I guess. Um, and so now we can use to calculate likelihoods, we can just say, hey, um, 50 is instead of, you know, we're not, we're still saying likelihood of, 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 of 50 here, but we're, we're saying given these um, parameters, estimated parameters, what, you know, what's the, the likelihood um, of finding 50, right? And so it's obviously really tiny for Adelaide and for chin straps, it's better. It's still not super, um, you know, likely, but when we get to, um, the Gen 2, it's, it's, it's even worse. So yeah, I mean, even though we don't have, you know, overwhelming evidence, but, but you know, based on what we, we know here and only know here, the, the best would be to say it's a, a chin strap, right? Um, and right. So then all we got to do is plug in, um, and this is the part I didn't want to have to try to recreate on my slide, but anyway, you can see here, um, We've, we've taken this uh, likelihood um, into our prior probabilities, which is, you know, how often are each of these occurring out, out of all possible uh, penguins. And so we can um, calculate the, um, you know, marginal PDF of um, observing any particular, um, just any, you know, penguin on average, um, 
you know, uh, with uh, a 50 millimeter long bill, right? So it's, we got this, and then we um, plug in, you know, the the, uh, the prob posterior probability of being an Adelai, given that we have a 50 millimeter bill. And um, yeah, we don't have a very good probability here, right? But we do for um, chin straps and for Gen 2, and in fact, um, you know, Gen 2 is the highest posterior probability. So even though the 50 millimeter um, long bill is relatively less common, the final classification is once, it's kind of the same thing all over again, right? Even though, you know, when we just kind of look at, you know, this distribution in isolation, isolation, we would think it should be chin strap, but actually chin straps are not very frequently occurring. So that has to take into consideration. So any, any questions or comments? Um, nope, okay. Um, so um, yeah. question, the, the fact that the chin straps are not common, this one, there's nothing like setting a prior, right? Mm -hmm. Like, or, the, or that was in the prior, that was the data, right? Right, yeah, this is all, this is all the data that we had above, right? So if you remember all the way up, up here, well, actually, hold on, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, we have, up, we have just 151 out of three. So this is all that we're using, right? The, yeah. Like, yeah, so we're just using sort of like we're just using the proportion of each uh, species within the, the sample as our prior sort of okay. inf information, and then we're all the only thing we're doing is we're adding this uh, likelihood uh, to tune our 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 posterior probabilities to figure out. Okay, okay. yeah, does that make sense? So uh, the likelihood is coming from the the 50 ml yep. 50, okay and the prior is having a higher weight because we use the prior of like distribution and population so mm -hmm. that one yeah and that's basically the same thing we want to find mm -hmm. what is the likelihood that if we pick a random it will be this species right so I think you want to say what's the probability? The, the probability. Leg, yeah, yeah. Just okay. to, not to be like I think is that am I right about that? Rob? We just say what's the pro, what's the what's the probability that we you know given that we have a, a, a penguin with a fifty millimeter bill bill length, right? Yeah, that's what we're doing. So there's yep. so many different like bill and like foot and I don't know. I can't keep track of all the body parts. Um, yeah. So I mean, all this is doing is saying okay, this is. Our estimated, you know, sort of population proportion of, um, I think this is Adelaide, right? Yeah, Adelaide, and then we're, we're multiplying that times the likelihood of um, having a fifty um, millimeter long bill, and yeah, there you go. That's that's our. This is you know this is our marginal probability distribution of observing any particular um, penguin with a fifty millimeter long bill yeah um okay yeah so then i i kind of um yeah uh one of the things they, they made note of is you know just so what we've kind of learned so far is, is you know depending on which predictor we use whether it's uh, categorical in the case of above below or above average weight and then um another one which is you know using you know, a particular value in a continuous distribution, um, we get different answers, right? So that's what happens when we start incorporating two answers. So now we have bill length, um, which we've already seen before. And then we have, oh, now, now we're looking at flipper length, right? Okay, so this is a new piece of information, right? Um, and so we can see here, we have very different, well, actually, I would say, the Adelaide are obvious, they're obviously the furthest left, but then, you know, the um, chin straps are, you know, they're the farthest to the right up on um, flipper, or uh, excuse me, um, bill length, but then on flipper length, they're, they're closer to the Adelaide. So the question becomes, you know, uh, are we better off using both pieces of information, which seem to have some conflicting sort of features for the, the the three species 
are we better off in trying to predict, you know, an average um, penguin drawing uh, from a, you know, sample or, or from a population given these two pieces of information? And then they have this really cool um, graph, although I can't really recreate it. They had a cool like um, piece that I think they put in after the fact, but um, yeah, so if we, this is kind of, this is a little bit like cluster analysis. I don't know if Ron or any of you have ever done this, but this is like a common thing that we do. In Only the, academically. <laughs> Only academically. Well, yeah, so I mean, I, I do, this happens a lot in industry, right, where you go, okay, we got all these features of people that are big, you know, they're, they're great users of your product, or they're, they're, they're great customers, or, or whatever, and so, you know, can we get some kind of I doubt you see such great separation, though. Huh? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, who knows if this is real data, right? But so obviously, by using both of these things together, we get a really nice sort of grouping effect that we can draw little circles more or less around each of these three things. And so, yeah, there does seem to be something that is um, meaningful. Now, um, one thing to point out, and I think I put this in below, is, you know, we're, once again, we're we're ultimately later on going to, you know, do these sort of naive Bayes classifications based on the assumption that the bill length and the flipper length are independent of each other, right? Which I don't know that that's warranted, but we're, we're, we're moving that way, right? And so that's, that's when, you know, this, this naive assumption really just means naive Bayes classifications are conditionally independent, right? Um, okay, so... Um, so yeah, sorry, go ahead. Conditionally independent, meaning that you cannot have a 50 uh, mm bill length and also be above, like both of your two characteristics must fit the species. Like you can't have disparate or is that? Yeah, actually, what, what, what's your read on that, uh, Ron, in terms of what, what, when you hear conditionally independent? I just they're, all they're saying, if you go up to the um, graph, uh, yeah. scatter plot. What they're saying is if you know the bill length, mm -hmm. it doesn't tell you uh, yes. anything uh, about, you know, the, where the other variable was, the oh, weight the, or something? Oh, sorry, the flipper, oh, flipper, flipper length, flipper. right? Yeah. And you can see that's actually not true, <laughs> right. but that's the assumption. But and it's not, it's actually kind of approximately true, like, because if you know the bill length, the bill length is for each species, I should say, right? Mm -hmm. Conditionally dependent for each species. So for the Gen 2, for example, right? If you know the bill length, it does it tells you something about the range. Kind sure. of, you can see there's some correlation, but it's weak. Yeah. Right. So that's okay. We're gonna we're gonna neglect that correlation completely. That's the assumption. That's the naive assumption. Right. Uh, and, and and you can see it'll probably work okay here because if I draw like a circle around the blue blob, you know, yeah. the fact that some of those dots don't get all the circle is probably not gonna matter so much in my in this yeah. particular case. In other cases, it might matter hugely. If that blue if the blue dots went down far to the left, right? The, if the Gen 2 were heavily mixed up with the Adeli, what do you call them, right? Then that would probably be a big problem. It would be a poor approximation, but. Yeah, no, that's a great but point. Anyway, the point is that you're assuming that the bill length doesn't, for a given species, <laughs> that's the conditional part, for a given species that the bill length doesn't depend. I think that's right. I think the conditional part is you, for each given species, you assume that uh, they're independent. Or maybe you have to assume they're completely independent. No, because yeah. you are conditioning on the species. So yeah, you're assuming that for each species, yeah, that the bill length, for example, is independent of flipper length. Flipper length, yeah. Because I can't see the axis, and I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah, I'm trying to keep up. It's, right. it's hard so, to keep. But look going. at the Adeli. That looks like there. In that case, it actually looks like a great uh, assumption, right? Yeah, so, it's pretty, pretty, pretty flat. But for the Gen two, it's it's not as easy to. Uh, right. We're seeing it nice, and but we're going to neglect. We're going to ignore that. That's a naive assumption, and see right. what happens anyway, right? Exactly. In the end, we're going to do cross validation, see how well we do, right? Or some kind of testing. So some kind of test. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in, in words, within these species, we assume that the length that, and which you already basically said, right? The length of the bill has no relationship. To oh, there you go. In words, <laughs> it was right there. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I should have said that. But I like the, you. You said something slightly different, which I like. So um, yeah. So this ma mathematically and computationally. Yeah, I I I liked it because. From graphically, we could see that there was a range, mm -hmm. but you can just probably know the range, but you can still, like, it's not like a direct indicator that, okay, you be this for the uh, flip palette. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's true. Um, 
yeah. So anyway, so I, I mean, I've already done this type of stuff um, for, well, I mean, we've, we've done it sort of the hard way in terms of, uh, you know, like in the book, they show us how they calculate, you know, using Bayes rule and all that stuff, but we can certainly just use the naive uh, Bayes function from, I believe it's from the uh, Bayes rules. Yeah, this it's, um, it's from this the package that the authors made for this book, um, which is nice. Uh, so yeah, we can have one where we just look at um, bill length and we have one where we look at bill and flipper length. And so um, obviously uh, we in the predict function has a nice thing where you can have the raw probabilities in or not, right? So um, not that, I don't know, once again, you guys aren't necessarily our users, right? I don't know about Amma, but I know um, no. Robert I, and, and Ron are not. So anyway, this is nice, right? So obviously Gen 2 is the largest number. And so it just, it just picks the largest number if you don't include type equals raw. So that's nice. Um, and so what's nice or what's interesting about this is, is it's, um, you get different answers if, we pick, uh, we have different models, right? So including both things, we get chin strap, right? So with a very high probability too, which is nice. Right, very high probability, right? So um, yeah, really high. I didn't even think about that actually. Um, so yeah, so this was um, kind of like the cheating way, I guess you could say, because I think they actually walked us through um, Oh, I forget now. Um, yeah, and on the exercises, they have you do it yourself as well for fake news data set. Yeah, actually, yeah, and I have that, and I was going to try to work through it if we have time. Oh, cool. Um, so, uh, yeah, so they actually do the whole work through here um, using Bayes' rule, and um, yeah, we saw that these numbers already before, and so that's all this naive base. Um, uh, uh, function is, is really accomplishing right okay so um I, I the more i think about it, the more i think i wish they would have like had this earlier in the book because it'd be a great application of bayes rules yeah right but maybe yeah. they thought about it and they said no no we got to focus on the you know the conjugate priors and all the rest of that so yeah i'm sure you they thought what? it through but you know what i think it is is i think like you know naive bayes is something you hear so much like in machine learning and stuff like yeah. that. yeah you know that we're like we're doing super simple kind of examples so it's not necessarily a fair comparison but maybe it's because it's sort of typically discussed as a type of machine learning sort of algorithm or whatever that's yeah it is yeah so maybe that's why they were kind of waiting because the perception is is it's is fancier or something yeah um, who knows um so yeah, so we learned this, I'm assuming last week, I didn't watch the video, sorry, I should watch it. Um, so, but having done a lot of logistic regression, we can get a nice confusion matrix to figure out how well we're doing of um, between what's expected and what we actually observe, you know, how well are we classifying people? And then we can do um, cross validation as a way of, you know, figuring out how stable, I guess you could say these, the accuracy is, right? So now- oh. Okay, yeah. so yeah. we we are still just using the bill length and flipper length. Yep, yep. In the case of okay. sorry, naive naive one is um. Let's make sure I'm. Yeah, that's just bill length, and then naive two is is bill and flipper length. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just calculating a um, posterior probability um, based on these um, these two classes, right? Okay, so yeah. like the confusion matrix is sort of like the, like doing the sensitivity and specificity, like yep. trying to see if your model is, was good. Yep, yeah, how well are you yeah. doing, right? And so this mm -hmm. is naive model one. So this is just, uh, let me double check this, sorry. It's just bill length, right? So just using bill length, we're, um, and we're we're not doing a great job of 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 um, predicting chin straps. Uh, we're we're doing pretty good jobs of Adel and and Gen two. This is now the the so yeah, so does that make sense, uh, Ama? So this is um, no. So this is not sensitivity and specificity, is it? Like 
Well, you like, can calculate those things from this, right? So since okay, the, from this, yeah. So this yeah. is Adelaide. Adelaide is like the, like, yeah. So that's like the true first. Exactly right. right. So this is, I believe the columns are. I mean, and maybe you're on. I'm, God, I haven't done this in so long. I haven't dealt with like um, confusion matrices in so long. Um, I believe this is um, what we actually observe, and this is um, um, what we predict on on the columns and so yeah the, i thought it was the other way around maybe it's the other way around sorry i'm not 100 sure but that's yeah, yeah. now i'm not 100 sure either that's what i assumed when i was working through the stuff now i wonder if i just made an assumption <laughs> anyway i'll yeah. tell you one thing it's a bit confusing but i'm bumped there you go there you go yeah so we could figure out so sensitivity is you know how um you know, how well are we identifying atolize that are really atolize and chin straps that are really chin straps and gen two that are really mm -hmm. gen two. And then specificity mm -hmm. is, is how well are we at not calling chin straps atoli and gen two, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, um, mm -hmm. and we could calculate that. I, I've only done it with dichotomous variables personally in my own work, but I'm sure you could probably do it in multi, you know, no meal yeah. situation like this. It would be a pain in the butt, I'm sure, but to do it by hand, but I'm sure there's ways of doing it. But let's see what happens when we incorporate the new information, right? So now all of a sudden, boom, adding, I believe it's um, flipper length. We don't really improve Adelaide that much. And we don't, well, we improve with Gentoo, but boom, we get a nice um, chin strap improvement here from that 9% almost that we had above, right? So that flipper length um, variable really kicks in and improves our, our confusion matrix. So we would. Yeah, know, it yeah, improves the, the, the gen two. Because at first it was like this last column had 85 mm -hmm. and 88. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What was happening? How could they have 85 and 88 in this? Is I thought like it was supposed to be 100% in the columns too, or it's just 100% in the rows. In the rows, I believe, okay. yeah, in the rows. So it's yeah. 100% in the rows. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, so yeah, maybe that, should, that, that that speaks to your point, Ron, which is this has got to be what reality is, right, in the rows, and then this is what we would predict based on the models. I think that's I think that's correct, right? Oh, yeah, that's a good way to determine it. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, you, you, just doing math, apparently. is I, I, <laughs> I should try that sometime. Um, yeah, so anyway... Um, yeah, so this this tells us, hey, we're doing something right because compared to this, we're really, you know, we have a much better. Um, to your point here, yeah, um, Ahmed, like, so when we just have um, bill length, we're getting a bunch of Gen twos, or excuse me, yeah, um, no, um, wait a minute, chin straps, chin straps that are being yeah. that are actually um, called they're being called Gen twos that should be called chin straps. Or, or, or mm -hmm. yeah, so they should be here, right? Mm -hmm. They're here, so they're getting misclassified as Gen twos. That's what's happening, and that kind of makes sense, right? In a way, because, um, well, actually, wait a minute, it doesn't make sense. Um, well, because this is the flipper length, right? So this is so this is a real differentiator. So before, yeah, so these two are really overlapping, right? So mm -hmm. this that first one where we had only nine percent of the chin straps. So that makes sense, right? Because they're overla their, their distribution of, of um, bill length is overlapping so much. It's easy to see how we would get, you know, a lot of misclassifications, but we add this thing in where we have a nice separation between chin strap and gen two, and boom, mm -hmm. we get this nicer, um, you know, sort of predictive, um, we get a nicer confusion matrices. Okay. Any other comments or? questions um so uh we can do cross validation on this once again i'm just taking this from you know the book directly and so now we have we've done this we've basically done a tenfold um cross -val and you guys talked about this in something last week so um using model two it was more like some weeks before oh was it yeah. okay yeah excuse me um Anyway, this is sort of the average um, across all 10 runs of the data, right? We're taking different subsamples and we're running the model to try to um, see how well we do. And so the average is 96, 87, 
98, you know, and so, but this is, what's nice about this is this, you can also run this and you get all of the correct um, um, predictions for each of the, the 10 runs. Does that make sense, right? So if we average these together, we should get 96.05. If we average these together, we should get 86, whatever. Um, so yeah, like this is sort of interesting, right? Like it's interesting because look at where we're having problems. It's the chin straps, right? Because there's still, because of the first predictor, maybe there's, there's overlap with the gen two. And so we're, we're probably, uh, we're not, we're not doing as good of a job with these chin straps. Maybe it's because they're, they're, they're less frequent too. They're a rarer species to, to actually try to predict. So, um, so that's all I had. Here's, um, I was going to do actually, well, let's, um, Maybe we could work through this a little bit. I mean, this is kind of corny, but we already kind of know why it's naive, right? We've talked about this a lot, this idea of conditional independence, assuming conditional independence for our predictors is why it's naive. And also there's two factors, right? The other factor is that you're assuming a normal distribution for oh, right, right, right. predictors. Great point, great point, yeah. Um, and it could be, you know, who knows? It could be like, a, I mean, actually it'd be kind of, I was thinking about this like well there could be things that are like kind of like more in a plus on distribution or something yeah like. you could do plus on uh naive bays as well as uh normal naive but not bays. but not the way it's set up here in this chapter. no you you can set it up though yeah so um maybe uh we could figure out so what let's figure out whether we could do logistic regression and naive bays or both so we want to figure out somebody is um, political affiliation democrat republican or other this hopefully is evident that um we're um just we, we'd have to do naive bays here because of the other right if we took this out right we you know then if we took out the other we could just be like you know republican yes or no democrat or yes or no and they're obviously mutually exclusive so we could do a logistic regression here, but since we have three categories, um, somebody wants to own a car, yes or no, that's pretty easy logistic regression. Although, or, can, naive or we could right? do naive bait. Yeah, right? Um, yes. Anything that we do with logistic regression, we could pretty much do with, with naive bays. Um, yeah, so um, that's, that's about it. Oh yeah, so here's what I, did um i just kind of started this and then I, like most things i ran out of time so what we're, we're trying to do here is, is we have a, a, a fake news i think we've already used this before in a previous chapter so we have a bunch yeah of, i think I mean, the beginning even. of the book okay. yeah oh, okay yeah i forget so we have a bunch of articles right um these are the titles these are the texts these are the urls and here's the authors and whether or not they're fake, right? How many title words, how many text words, how many, you know, they have, we have all kinds of things that we could try to do. Um, the title exclamation, right? That's, that's, seem, oh, it's, excuse me, um, title exclamation percentage, right? So there's all kinds of things that we could, the title has an exclamation mark is, is our predictor potentially for whether this is a fake or a real um, article. So when we do this, we have, this is the type, this is what's actually real, right? And this is um, whether or not the title has um, an exclamation mark in it, yes or no. So uh, right off the bat, we have two articles that have a uh, title with an exclamation mark that are considered real. So that's not great, right? Just off the bat, right? So now they want us to go through and do the whole like by hand thing. And I just, you know, I didn't think we were going to have time, so I just ran with. I created a a data frame with a real um, article with a you know having an exclamation in the title, and this is our model, which is we're trying to predict the type given the nature of you know whether there's an exclamation in the uh, the title, and so when we predict, we get obviously. Overwhelmingly, we get you know the prob posterior probability of being fake, you know, by quite a large margin. Um, we could have, I could have done it by hand, but you know, and I should have done other ones, but we're actually nearly out of time. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this was really cool. I, I, I mean, like to your to you, um, 
you guys' points about, you know, like maybe we should have done this earlier. Yeah, it does feel like we kind of have been doing some version of this since early on, right, in the book, whether, you know, we didn't call it naive Bayes, but we did use prior information, posterior kind of stuff to, to figure out like what is going on here, right? Like what is, what's the most likely thing to occur? So that's, that's about it. Um, any, the only thing you, you didn't really talk about is the comparison of naive bays for the two for two um, category case with logistic. Yeah, I, I, I had a question about that. Maybe if you could show your screen on yeah. the because I'm reading here and it says that um, though naive bays is computationally efficient. Mm -hmm. It makes some rigid and it often inappropriate assumptions about data structures. And yeah. I'm a bit, yes. a bit confused. It says you lose some nuance with naive base on like log logistic regression because it doesn't have the beta I. Right. You don't get that nice little. Oh, oh right. The, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. What's the effect of the, uh, you know, one more flipper length millimeter or whatever on the probability mm. right that kind of thing you don't get that slope um information and you also don't get like the posterior distribution on that slope either you don't get all that nice information to get out of logistic regression um yeah. surprisingly for me though it turned out I, I did the whole i did that whole in fake news thing and you do you do the naive base and the logistic regression on that one because it is only two things right fake or real and i actually the logistic regression and the naive base for the the largest model worked exactly. They gave the same answer basically. So it was, huh. yeah. there you so go. it's really about what kind of information I could have got. I can get more information out of the logistic regression results. So rather than just the yes, no answers I can get, or rather than just the probability predictions, I can get uncertainties on the probabilities, which is nice, right? Yeah. And get the slopes and the uncertainties on those as well. So you get more stuff out of logistic regression, I think is the main. Yeah, that's right. The pro of the base again, it's super fast. It's like you said, it's not it's extremely efficient computation. It's just arithmetic, and uh, it's uh, yeah, and it's you can use it for more predictors or more categories very easily as well. That's the other advantage to my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about. I mean, I've never used naive base except like in a classroom kind of setting, right? So, I mean, I've used logistic regression a ton just because yeah. it's one of the most common things in medicine right i mean it's just you know everyone does it because there's a lot of those types of outcomes that you know now also i would say multinomial is is, is taking a in, in i'm not talking about Bayesian. i'm just talking in general yeah. multinomial regression is becoming increasingly you know like i work a lot in neurology and so there's lots of kinds of classifications right classifying different you know, uh, strokes or different types of, you know, head traumas or, I don't know, like, or based on, you know, a bunch of other variables. So, yeah. Um, so you do a lot of multinomial at work? Oh, I used to. I used to work at Cleveland Clinic, which is like a big hospital. And, um, you know, so okay. like, so we have a bunch of data and they're trying to figure out, you know, um, based on, you know, like, I don't know, trying to, you know, trying to predict what kinds of events will happen to patients down the road or, you know what I mean? So there's like more mm -hmm. than two, two outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there might, you might want to try to figure out like which one is most probable or most possible. So um, I got a, I got a jet here in a minute. I got a, I got a meeting and I got to do a few things. Uh, okay. more, I think we got everything covered again. Yeah. Uh, we can, you guys can, free to engage on the Slack, start a little thread on the Slack if anything else comes up about this chapter, yeah. or if you do the exercises, you know, questions. I did the um, the applied exercises for the fake news all the way through, so I can help yeah. with that. I'm, and I'd love to compare answers if anyone else does it. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll try to get into it. Yeah, it's um, fourth quarter is really rough for me. I should have taken that into consideration when I started this, because I, I don't know about y'all, but my work, it's mm -hmm. like, a lot of things get pushed, you know, so we have to get uh, a bunch of things done that, you know, I will say the next chapter is pretty, uh, an, another lighter chapter is more conceptual. So that might help ease your uh, stress a little bit. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it sounds like the first one, and then we, we start getting into, you know, like 16, 17, 18. Yeah. So, 
particular cases of it, yeah. So I think we each have one more presentation to make. It sounds yeah. like there's like four of us and uh, we're okay. more or less. So that's uh, easy. So who's who's next week? I'm signed up for next week unless somebody else wants to take it over. Yeah. Like I said, it is, a, it is an easier section. It's more conceptual. So if somebody else did want to do it, I would be happy to do one of the more, oh, I would, I was more challenging, but one of the more longer chapters. Um, no, that's fine. I'll probably do um well that's fine I'll, i i i can't do it next week so okay yeah anyway i gotta to, to okay. I'll see you guys next Thanks week yeah, guys. yeah ron time, buddy. can you uh i just want to ask a question yeah go ahead i'll stay out for a second okay yeah you, so i've bye ryan bye so i've been um working also through the richard but like that's oh, story yeah. thinking that's great and um because he it's like he teaches three things at once he's teaching you stats and he's teaching you like causal thinking with dags and then he's teaching you bayesian also so um i was just want to ask do you do like more because like causal thinking helps you to see how you like you make your priors right yeah do you do that in your work? What's your experience like, like with how he's teaching it versus what you actually do in real life? That's well. To be honest, question. I haven't really. Yeah. I only started going through his book, and then I kind of got sidetracked into this book. So I do intend to go mm -hmm. back to it. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure what particular things he's talking about that you're referring to, but um, well, like uh, I do. I would refer to him. A yeah, the dags and all that. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so okay. I've not directly used those in that way, mm -hmm. but you do. I do have to think about those kind of correlations, and uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. But I really need to dig into that book again because that's that whole. I, that's kind of where I stopped reading is right around that section where we started going through all that haunted dags or whatever it's called. The haunted mm -hmm. dag is that what it was called that chapter? Anyway, you know, so, I I I'm not reading his book because the book is kind of high for me. So I I watched the YouTube videos just like. Ah when yeah. it's like i'm usually doing something else so it takes me a long time to get through a video because i have to go back and forth but then like some things stick so yeah so and for us in health epidemiology we do like it's like a the hot new thing dag so i was like huh let me see but yeah thank you so much yeah no worries okay so we'll see you next week yes Okay. okay. All right. Bye.